are good to go. Um, is there anything more you need from me or can you just go straight ahead? Okay, so, so you're recording now and you're doing all that you need to do? I'm, I'm, what I'm doing at the moment is going, we're just going live. And then once we come back from that, I'm going to start recording. So give me a second. You know, Vessel's asked for this recording. So give me just a second to get back into the previous screen. Jackie, sorry, I just want to know time-wise, um, I can keep you here the whole night. So we set, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so we set together a um, an hour. Sorry, Jackie, you on mute. Sorry, for for about an hour, maybe you can do a teaching. That we hope to actually have um, some uh, um, feedbacks and questions. Okay. okay, so I'm now recording. Okay, thanks, Vessel. We're in your hands. Okay, good. Well, good evening, everybody, and and uh, thank you to Jackie for uh, for inviting me to um, to share with you a little bit. Um, so Jackie told me that the topic for the series is on social justice. Um, so I asked the question, well, where do we begin? You know, where do we start the process? Um, and as I've been doing my research um, uh, and preparing for this evening, I mean, I could not have imagined uh, to, to, you know, to witness the the anarchy, the, the chaos that is uh, taking place across our country. So, um, and obviously there's a very, very strong social justice um, uh, link to what we are witnessing. And um, we, we are conscious of that. So what, what I have to share with you this evening um, is a little bit more removed. Uh, it is taking one step back um, so please don't feel that I'm being insensitive to what is going on, you know, out there um, or around us. Uh, I, I'm fully aware of that and we are sensitive to that. Um, I, I just want to take one step back uh, this evening uh, to, to ask, you know, where do we, where do we um, uh, start this, uh, this journey? So um, I have a uh, presentation here. Uh, I don't always like to have only presentation. Okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, what I'll do is I will only go to my slides when I when I need to go there, uh, so that you know I can see you, you can see me, and and there we go. Right. Um, as we start, I would like to ask you to put down your pens and your pencils. Um, it's only for the next uh, two minutes. Uh, put down your pens, pencils, uh, take away any distractions. If you'd like to close your eyes, you're welcome to do so. And for the next few moments, I would like you to think of all the people who you love. Who do you love? You can name them by name, you can picture them, perhaps recall some memories. Okay, I think uh, uh, we have a fair idea of, uh, of who we love. Right, you can open your eyes and you can uh, take your pencils and, and things again. So my question to you is now in this list of uh, people um, that you thought of and that you named in your mind, how many of you named yourself? Is there anybody here who named themselves? Okay, right. Now I need to credit my my support group or the support group that I belong to uh, for that exercise. Certainly, when I did that uh, exercise, uh, it was an eye-opening experience to uh, to you know 
just think about how how much I you know I'm supposed to care for myself. Uh, we take it for granted that we love ourselves, uh, but uh, we <laughs> we are not always that vocal in in reminding ourselves that you know we are loved, uh, that we are people who um, who participate in this gift of life, and that I am allowed to to love uh, myself. So the starting point for me in social justice, where do we begin? Uh, for me, it starts with with self. Um, uh, how how do how do I have a relationship with myself, and what uh, how do I care for myself in in a manner that is life giving and affirming? So, when we turn to scripture, Matthew chapter twenty two, it is a very very well known uh, piece of scripture. Matthew twenty two verses thirty seven to thirty nine. Uh, I'll actually go a few verses before that from verse 34. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest command in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So, if we take that uh, that passage, uh, I think you know we and we recite those uh, uh, that passage, um, whether it is in a sermon or whether we repeat that verse to ourselves or whatever the context may be. Uh, we we tend to say, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength." Love your neighbor, uh, and then we whisper, "As you love yourself." We don't really know what that means. If we juggle the order around a little bit, and I, I just pose it to you as a question, what would the world look like when you love yourself as much as what you love your neighbor? Would your life look any different? Uh, I think uh, one of the, the great um, pitfalls in caring professions, whether it is ministry or social work or whatever, whatever the context may be, where, where one encounters other people and where one's calling is to serve people around us, um, one of the big things that we notice is that caregivers often suffer, uh, suffer burnout uh, because they love people more than what they love themselves. Uh, people would uh, tend to, to go to many great lengths to, to assist people in need around them uh, while they themselves need some uh, nurturing uh, and some care. If we ask the question, well, why are we hesitant to speak about loving ourselves? I think it has a long history uh, in terms of philosophy, religion, culture, um, uh, all different kinds of influences where, uh, where we experience a, a deep-seated bias against self. There's a deep-seated bias against self. Um, uh, my friend at uh, Northwest University, uh, Professor Anay Verhoef, um, mentioned this in, in one of his lectures uh, just the other day, that it doesn't matter, you know, well, uh, it doesn't matter which culture you go to or which religion you, you look at, there seems to be this underlying uh, teaching or narrative that says, uh, I am broken, I am not whole, I am not good enough. Uh, if we look specifically at the, the Christian uh, tradition in the order of salvation, the first teaching we get to know is we are all sinners. 
we are all sinners. Uh, and certainly that is true. We are all sinners. Um, but to identify ourselves with, uh, in, in that space as a primary identity becomes a bit problematic because it leads to a process of self-shame. I am not good enough. I'm not good enough for God. I'm not good enough for the church. I'm not good enough to receive communion. I'm not good enough to become a member of the church. Uh, you name it. Um, uh, and uh, in addition to that kind of self-shame, uh, there is also the very overt uh, teaching uh, that comes from many a pulpit, which, which you know, uh, centers around uh, this whole mentality of people are bad and they need something good. You know, they, they have to become better. Now, uh, one of the stories that I tell, um, you know, to, to my congregation is that when I came to uh, the Glen Methodist Church in Pretoria, um, no, sorry, it was before that. When I, when I came to seminary, uh, we were at John Wesley College in Kilnerton. Um, uh, I discovered Hatfield. Now, back in those days, Hatfield was, you know, really the place to, to be, and there were movies, and um, coming from Coltonville, movies were luxury. So uh, uh, when my brother came to visit, I told him, you know, we have to go to Hatfield to go and watch, uh, watch a movie. In any case, so my brother and I went over to Hatfield, uh, got to the shopping center, and we were a bit late, um, uh, as good Methodists always are. Uh, and um, walking into the shopping center, there were these two young gents who approached us and um, they asked the following questions. Do you know Jesus? So now you can imagine I'm on a bit of a tight schedule. Uh, I want to get to the movies. Yes, I know Jesus. Um, you know, Jesus is quite a, quite a nice guy, you know. Uh, do you know that if you don't know Jesus, you'll go to hell? I said, okay. Um, right, we can have a, a big discussion uh, about that. Uh, but yes, certainly for me, Jesus is part of, you know, uh, experiencing life in all its fullness. So, so that's all fine. Uh, then the guy said, um, well, do you know that if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, you are going to go to hell? I said, well, uh, I believe that, you know, God's Spirit moves uh, and uh, and prompts all of us, um, and we can have a big discussion about that. But you know, God's spirit is part of this life-giving uh, spirit that gives us our identity. Uh, then he went on and said, "Well, do you know that if you are Catholic, you will go to hell?" And I said, "No, well, I don't. Uh, I don't agree with that statement. Do you know that if you are in here, you'll go to hell?" So I said, "Well, I also don't agree with that statement." And then he pushed the, the, the one button uh, with me and he said, and you, do you know that if you are a Methodist, you are going to go to hell? And I responded, uh, and, and I say this, um, you know, and I hope uh, there's nobody who's going to complain, but uh, this is a truthful response. I, I said to the guy, well, sir, uh, I'm going to go to the movies. You can go to hell, you know. Um, but uh, sorry, uh, sorry for that. But the point being that our, our, our declaration, the first words that we speak to people is that they are bad and that they need something good. You know, there's something amiss in my life. So it comes natural to us to have this deep-seated bias against self. I am not perfect. I have to be better and I'm not worthy of God. Uh, I'm not worthy of the Christian faith. I'm not worthy of, of any recognition or anything like that. And therefore, you know, I should be excluded for all means and purposes. The follow-on question from that is, well, why should we speak about loving ourselves? Uh, and I'm not speaking about this narcissistic, self-centered, arrogant kind of self-love. I'm, I'm simply speaking about an honest uh, appreciation for the gift that God has given to me for being me and in me striving to become, you know, more and more like Jesus every day. Why should we speak about loving ourselves? 
Well, first of all, I think that there is a difference between uh, earned love and grace. Uh, there's, there's a difference between earned love and grace. What is earned love? Okay, so let us say, for instance, one lives in a uh, religion where it says, if I do this, then God will do that. So if I read my Bible, I pray every day, I go to church, I give my tithes, you know, I speak in tongues, I do all kinds of things that, uh, um, you know, that prove that I'm worthy of God's love and God's grace, then God will say, my, you know, this is my beloved child. With you, I am well pleased. That is an earned kind of love. Uh, uh, something which John Wesley called a salvation by works. Um, it, is, uh, it is us trying to find approval with God. But when we read the, the gospel story and when Jesus encounters the different people in different contexts, um, the main thread of his teaching is, is not if I do this, then God will do that. The starting point for Jesus is because God is this, you can do that. Because God is love, you are a person of worth. Because God reaches out, because God uh, sees the marginalized. God hears the cries of the poor. You can, uh, you, you can approach the throne of grace with confidence, um, as Paul says. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 16, I think one of the, 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 the least recognized um, pieces of, uh, of Scripture. And it is his spirit who testifies to our spirits that we are children of God. That is the premise. That is where God starts. Um, and for me, it is, it, it is such a powerful swing in, in how we can view church, our Christian life, my secular life, you know, all different aspects of my being, that God comes to me first and says, Vessel, you are loved. And because you are loved, you can love yourself. And as you love yourself, I would like you to love others. That change in dynamic then moves us to a place which says that before we can uh, progress to the point of showing acts of empathy or showing acts of, of altruism, uh, the, there is this preceding step which says I need to, I need to care for myself. Uh, there is no social justice without justice in self. Uh, how I treat myself. If I cannot love myself, then how am I going to progress to the point of uh, loving people around me? So what is a good life? What is a good life? Um, in some of my thinking, I, I think a good life is a place where I'm able to care for myself, practice empathy, and which is then followed by acts of altruism. Now, altruism is, uh, is defined as acts that I perform, uh, which uh, may not benefit me, but will benefit others. So self-care, empathy, what is empathy? Empathy is my ability to place myself in, uh, in a situation where I can identify with others. So when I have self-care, I can start identifying with people around me, uh, which is then followed by acts of altruism. 
Now, my struggle with, uh, uh, with some teachings is that we focus so much on the acts of altruism that we forget about the empathy and we forget about the self-care. So once again, there may be a lot of people, and Jesus even uh, points to, uh, to this. He says, you know, many, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, you know, did we not do this and did we not do that? Um, I can't recall now the exact scripture and verse of that, but you, I think you know what, uh, what passage I'm talking about. Uh, many will come to me and say, Have I not, did I not do this? Did I not do that? And I will turn to, that, to them and I will say, turn away from me. I don't know you. Um, now, what does that mean? Well, it is, once again, that salvation by works trying to earn god's love through acts of generosity and so forth without there being the preceding is preceding step empathy which means a a sincere identification with my neighbor so that my acts are not just acts of um, you know uh, for for ticking the box with god or with the church or whatever the case may be but that when I care for my neighbor, I care for my neighbor because I care for my neighbor. Uh, and in turn, I cannot care for my neighbor if I am not taking care of myself. Right. Okay. So a few words on empathy. Uh, so I, th I think uh, just to go back. If we, we look at self-care, self-care becomes the foundation for empathy and then later on acts of altruism, which then leads to a broader translation of social justice. Okay, so what is empathy? As we said before, empathy is my ability to identify with uh, people around me. Um. <sighs> A friend of mine, Christian Kaiser, uh, wrote a book called The Empathic Brain. Uh, and if you would like to, to go and read a little bit more about uh, empathy and how empathy works physically within the structures of the brain, that is an excellent resource to, uh, to, uh, to go and look up. But in any case, uh, so empathy for years and years has been treated as um, either a personality trait or um, uh, you know, with uh, an inherent uh, uh, thing, or um, you know, uh, something that we that we simply have, or we we don't have. Um, science has shown us that uh, that that is in fact not the case. Uh, uh, empathy. Uh, there are parts of the brain that well, we, we start with with empathy from a very very young age or the building blocks for empathy from a very young age uh, called mimicking so um, I, I i put it to you if you have a uh, uh, a little child who is able to to speak or able to do something have you ever had that experience where they're in a social situation and then they say something which leaves you absolutely red-faced Okay, that is a yes for me. I don't know about you, um, but uh, and then uh, then you know that they are simply echoing something that they have heard before. Uh, you know, uh, whether it be from me or somebody else, it is always you know why are ministers' children so naughty? It is because they mimic the congregation's kids. That is uh, that's the reason why they're so naughty. Um, but no, not really. But uh, mimicking uh, teaches us certain life skills. How do we learn to speak? We mimic. Uh, how do we learn certain behavioral traits? Or how do we learn uh, culture, customs, traditions, etc.? We form part of a community and we, we, uh, we mimic uh, one another. So there are uh, what is called mirror neurons in, in our brains, which help us to, uh, to mimic, but also to identify with others. So there was an experiment done where uh, a certain primate was, uh, was given uh, peanuts, 
and they measured the the brain activity in this primate um, uh, to see you know what uh, what centers of the brain uh, activated when they were fed peanuts and then uh, they were separated from uh, from from uh, from another uh, uh, primate of, uh, of the same species and they gave the other one peanuts while measuring primate A's brain. And when the other one ate peanuts, exactly the same centers of the brain lit up as when that primate um, uh, got, uh, got peanuts. So there's an identification with the other, whether it is joy, whether it is sadness, whether it is eating, whatever the case may be, uh, mm -hmm. there is th this inherent ability to learn uh, empathy, uh, to, to learn what another must be experiencing, or we think we know what another must be thinking at a certain point in time. Now, just to illustrate this, I'm going to uh, put uh, something on the screen for you. Um, right uh, from current slide. Okay, there we go. Uh, uh, let me just uh, see where, where we are now. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you a picture, and I would like you to note the emotions that, that are stirred. What, 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 stir, what, what is stirred within you? Okay, look at this picture. Okay, Jackie, what do you feel when you see this picture? For some reason, I'm not seeing a picture other than maybe are you... Have we given you the... Are you not the... Neither can I, Vessel. Uh, can't you see the picture? Oh, uh, dear. Okay, let's see. Have, have you... You should oh, see shit. the... Okay, wait, 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 wait. Sorry, I've got it. I've got it. Yeah, okay. there we go. Okay. Okay, got it. Okay. Jackie, oh, what? Joy. Joy. Real Are you still joy. enjoying yourself when you see this picture? No, well, hang on. I have to, like, remember I've got my glasses on. Well, my first thing was a happy child, but maybe not so happy that I get a little bit closer. No. <laughs> okay. No, it doesn't no, no, need no. a picture. Say again. Now you made me doubt my first response. <laughs> Don't doubt. It Just looks go like with a happy child. Okay. Well, I can certainly tell you when I saw this uh, this picture of this child, it filled me with uh, with joy. I could almost oh. hear this child laughing. Can you hear the child laughing? Yeah, 100%. Mm. Okay, right. Okay, I'm not, uh, I'm not priming you yet. Okay? Uh, right, Jackie, test number two. What do you feel when you see this picture? Sorry, let me just... Uh, oh, now, how do I get... The, uh, right, here we go. This picture. Oh. Okay. Um, um, pain. Well, exercise. Pain, maybe. Actually, pain. I know that sounds strange. It's quite a good thing to when your feet are sore after you've run because you've done some work. <laughs> okay. You're overthinking this, Jackie. You're overthinking. I know. Uh, pain. <laughs> right. Pain. Can, can you almost feel the pain when you see this picture? Yeah, no, for sure. Okay. Right, so okay, I'm going to stop sharing and yeah, we're back to, uh, to myself now. Right, okay, the point of that is when, when, we, uh, when we see uh, responses around us, uh, it stimulates something within us that we can identify with and we are moved um, to, to mirror those emotions or, or, uh, or, or that thinking uh, that we project or, or that we perceive uh, from people around us. Uh, studies have been shown that um, uh, empathic behavior uh, is to a large degree learned behavior. It can be developed. One can't go and give a pill for people to become more empathic. Uh, there, there's no medication that we can uh, prescribe to, to make people more compassionate or anything like that. But we can certainly, uh, we can certainly help people through uh, different means, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, et cetera, et cetera, to, um, uh, uh, to learn uh, to move towards a more empathic uh, way of, uh, of living. 
if there's no self-care, one will find it difficult to show empathy, and I'll illustrate that uh, uh, shortly. So no self-care, no empathy, no desire for social justice, which will lead to no altruistic action. Right. So the question is, are there some tools that we can use to promote self-care and in turn, uh, which will benefit us in helping to become more uh, more empathic uh, when, when we uh, encounter people around us. So some of the tools for self-care are also the building blocks for empathy. So some of these are, okay, I'm just going to, uh, to chat about four of these. The first one is the tool of time. How do I care for myself? I can care for myself by managing my time. Now, social psychologists uh, tell us that if we look at our time, it would be a good thing if we can structure our day in the following way. So we have 24 hours that, uh, um, that, we, uh, that we have at our disposal at any uh, given point in, well, uh, uh, during a day, and we can break it up as follows. So we can dedicate, uh, and so this is now uh, just a very, very broad um, a description, and I'm sure it's not going to uh, to, to be true for uh, for a lot of people. But this is just a, a, a baseline. So if I can divide my 24 hours up in the following way: eight hours work, eight hours sleep, four hours maintenance, which means doing the shopping, doing the cooking you know, doing all that I need to do in order to make life happen. And then the last four hours be dedicated to self-care. Okay, so there's my 24 hours. Eight hours sleep, eight hours work, four hours maintenance, four hours self-care. Now, I'm quite sure that when, when we go to the first two, when we say when we talk about sleep, very few people actually manage to to sleep a, a, a full eight hours uh, in the night. It's very important for for the brain to receive eight hours uh, uh, of of sleep. Um, it, it is a recalibration of our uh, of, of of our brain chemicals. Uh, it helps with concentration during the day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Numerous um, studies have been done on the benefits of adequate sleep. Okay, so eight hours. But I'm sure that we say, you know, but uh, yeah, I can do with very, very little sleep. But then where does that time go to? Then people will say, well, I don't only work eight hours a day. I, uh, I work, you know, uh, without stop uh, at least 15, 16 hours a day because I need to get the job done or whatever the, uh, the, the reason may be. Uh, and there we can go to a whole understanding or even a theology of work, which Dion Foster uh, specializes in, uh, and you can uh, contact him about that. Um, but uh, the whole frame of thinking of being uh, our identities being caught up in our workspaces, which, which is not always uh, very helpful for family life, for friendships, for relationships, etc. The four hours maintenance, I think, you know, we, we all have more or less on par, but the four hours self-care is gravely lacking. Um, and that self-care is my time. When is my time and what do I do in my time? So that's the first building block, time. How do I manage time in order to love myself? If I don't love myself, I will find it difficult to empathize with others and I will find it difficult to find any reason to get actively involved in uplifting society around me. Okay, so time. The second one is imagination. Imagination is, uh, is, is something which has fallen along the wayside of, uh, of uh, Western society at least because we have stopped telling stories. Um, we, uh, 
uh, we like to, to deal with concrete facts. I want to know what we are going to have for supper and, you know, put all of the, uh, the, uh, the ingredients in the pot and, you know, this is what we are eating. Go and sit down, uh, eat, and then move on to, to the next activity. Imagination plays a vital role in the formation of mirror neurons. Um, so who better to go to? And I didn't say that, I uh, don't say that, uh, that this is the, the reason why Jesus did this, but I find it fascinating that when Jesus taught his disciples about uh, moral, ethical, religious behavior, whatever Jesus did in his teaching, Jesus told stories. Jesus told parables. Why did Jesus tell parables? Well, Jesus was tapping into people's emotional centers. Imagine that there was this father who had two sons. And the one son came to his father and said, Hey, dad, I want my inheritance and went on. Can you feel the emotion that is evoked in that? That is certainly different to Jesus standing in front of, uh, uh, of a board or Jesus using a PowerPoint presentation and uh, giving a formal lecture on the benefits of gratitude uh, or the benefits of grace. Uh, I mean, Jesus could have lectured until he was blue in his face. Uh, very few people would have caught on to what Jesus was trying to say. But what, what, is, what does Jesus do? Jesus uses parables. Jesus uses stories about people so that they can imagine for themselves. I can put myself in that father's position. Or I can put myself in that child's position. Or I can put myself in the position of the woman who lost a coin. Etc., etc., etc. I can put myself in the shoes of the Samaritan sometimes, you know, um, who, uh, who goes and, uh, uh, and picks up this wounded person and cares for them. Perhaps sometimes I can identify with a wounded person and that I need some picking up. Jesus tells stories, and with these stories, imagination sparks these mirror neurons where we are able to identify with people around us. So what helps with imagination? Well, stories, parables, reading books. Reading books is a phenomenal way of, uh, of getting into characters and feeling, identifying with characters in a novel. Um, what about watching movies? We think watching movies is only, you know, when we are lazy and um, uh, if, if we have nothing else to do. But when last have you watched a movie where your emotional center is, uh, is activated, uh, where we cry in a movie or we laugh with characters? Um, all of those are, are ways in which we identify and we, we nurture our ability to be able to identify with people around us. Any acts of creativity, um, whether it is building puzzles together as, uh, as couples or, um, you know, painting a wall or something. Uh, all of these group activities, creative activities, help us in socializing and, and uh, being in contact with people around us. Okay, so time is one of the building blocks for self-care and empathy. The second is imagination, to take some time to unlock my imagination. Imagination is not just for the lazy. Uh, it, well, I think one is lazy if one does not use your imagination, because with imagination comes great creativity and de-stressing and so forth. The third uh, building block, which I'd like to, to just refer, refer to quickly, is uh, the building block of reflection, uh, being able to remember. So here, uh, there are two things uh, just off the cuff uh, that we, we can look at. Something like journaling, for instance. Journaling is a fantastic way to, to re reflect back on my day. Um, I can sit uh, at the beginning of the day and I can plan my day, but I cannot always say what my responses are going to be or how I'm, how I'm going to feel throughout the day. 
I can remember when our first son uh, was born, uh, Matthew. Uh, it only later came out that Matthew had severe heart problems and um, yeah, it, it made life uh, very interesting. But I, I can remember the day that our firstborn was born. Uh, I was a very energetic young guy. Uh, I sat down that morning and I planned my day. So Natalie went in for cesarean section, which was uh, scheduled for eight o'clock in the morning. And so my schedule read uh, six o'clock, get to the hospital, eight o'clock, Matthew will be born. Uh, stay with Ma Natalie until 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, have my first meeting, two o'clock, have counseling session, wada wada, all that kind of stuff. And my day was fully planned. Ha ha, surprise, surprise. So Matthew is born. He turns blue. Uh, they rush him to uh, neonatal, uh, discover that he has a heart problem. And my whole day went to bits. Okay. My day did not pan out as I planned. Now, planning is important, but what is important, as my bad English uh, um, uh, uh, comes through, what is more important is my ability to reflect on the past day. Otherwise, days start flashing by uh, and I can't keep track of where I am anymore. Sitting at the end of the day, looking back at my day, saying, yes, I had a meeting. My meeting was difficult. It was complicated. I felt this. Um, when I looked around me, I could see that people were feeling uncomfortable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or I had this joyous uh, event. Uh, Natalie arrived at uh, at my office. She surprised me with a cupcake. You know, whatever the case may be. And I can uh, reflect on that, and I can say, this is what I felt. So journaling, giving account to myself of what I'm feeling and giving voice to my feelings, saying when I'm sad, when I'm angry, when I'm disappointed, when I'm joyous, when I'm overwhelmed, when I'm surprised. All of those are wonderful, wonderful ways in which I connect with myself. And when I connect with myself, when other people experience similar emotions, those mirror neurons start working and I can see things happening in them that I can identify with. So journaling, also accountability groups. So something like a, a Bible study group or simply a confidant, uh, a friend um, or a spouse. A spouse is not always uh, uh, the best, you know, uh, but to get an outside perspective, uh, another friend, to sit down and to simply ask the question, how are you? and for the question to be posed in return and to have an honest conversation with one another. So time, imagination, reflection, uh, uh, all part of self-care. And then the last one, which I want to spend a little bit more time on, is the block, building block of communication. Uh, the building block of communication. Sorry, let me just quickly get my... Uh, slide here. Okay, communication. Um, so my field of, of, of interest is in uh, um, the the link between psychology and uh, and religion. Um, and the one thing that uh, that has really struck me was a study done by uh, Professor Jean. Uh, I think you pronounce her surname. Twenge or Twing, uh, T W E N G E, um, where she looks at the the changing behaviors in children, in developmental psychology, and and what is noteworthy not only in her studies but uh, in studies around the world, is that there is this sudden marked rise in narcissistic behavior in children. What is narcissistic behavior? Uh, narcissistic behavior is uh, uh, behavior where uh, I'm so focused on myself that I have no uh, no place for um, uh, for for empathy or being able to identify with people around me. I see that my time is uh, is running out, so I'm just quickly going to to go through this. So, uh, uh, no, narcissistic behavior in children. Why? Uh, Jean's uh, studies have shown that the way in which we communicate has a huge impact on our 
way in which we relate with one another, whether we are able to be empathic or whether we tend to to, to narcissistic behavior. Communication worldwide has become increasingly impersonal. <clears throat> so why do we say that? Most of communication happens via text, WhatsApp, okay? It's very, very uh, 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 prominent amongst our young people, especially, that all communication happens via thumb, okay? Uh, there's uh, a rise in online bullying. Uh, and what makes online bullying uh, almost more severe than physical bullying is that, uh, that there are three factors in online bullying uh, that, um, you know, that compound the, the nature of the bullying. The first one is that online bullying is 24 hours. You're not just encountering the bully at school. It's 24 hours. Secondly, there's a certain sense of anonymity associated with, uh, with online bullying. You can keep your identity private while you are sending uh, direct messages via uh, a fake profile, or whatever, to another person. So 24-hour contact, anonymity, and uh, the third one is lack of nonverbal communicative feedback. What does that mean? Well, if a bully is a physical bully, a bully and they are, you know, shoving a child around uh, and they see the child starting to cry, then there is some sense in which their behavior will become metered. Um, whereas with, uh, with online bullying, there are no nonverbal communicator communicative feedback cues, so the bullying just continues. Right, it's another study that I just quickly want to refer to, uh, one by Celsa Ziegler and Pollack, <clears throat> and what they did uh, was to take a group of children um, and to expose them all to a common stressor, so they gave them all a maths uh, paper to, to go and write, and you can imagine that, uh, you know, they, they got all uh, flustered, then they divided the, the group up into four uh, subgroups. The first group, they, uh, they allowed access to their parents straight away, physical presence. The second, uh, they only provided verbal access, so they were able to speak to one or both parents via the phone. Uh, third is that they were only allowed to text. And the fourth one, uh, no contact with the parents at all. And then they measured two uh, hormones um, in, uh, in, in the children. The first one is a, a hormone called uh, cortisol, which is your stress hormone. Now, we all have a stress hormone, and it is at a certain level. And sometimes our levels will spike, and then it will regulate to uh, a normative base. It doesn't disappear, but it's, it, it regulates. It comes back. And then the second is the uh, hormone called oxytocin, which is the cuddle hormone. Um, so if you have your loved one close by, or you, if you have a pet, or even if you have a teddy bear, just take them and give them a hug for 20 seconds, okay? Or even your pillow. <laughs> but uh, uh, that uh, after 20 seconds, one feels the effect of oxytocin being released in the brain, uh, and that is that comfort, um, uh, comfort hormone that is then uh, uh, that is then released. So the outcomes of this was okay. Uh, I only have uh, two slides left, Jackie. So and if you can just give me five minutes, okay, then I'll be done. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the outcomes. It's a very very interesting study. So the the children who who gained full access to their parents after the stressor. Uh, had high levels of oxytocin very quickly, and the cortisol levels regulated very quickly in a short space of time. So full access to parents, high oxytocin, feel cared for, stress hormone regulates very quickly. Those who have voice access, also high oxytocin because they heard the parent's voice, but a slightly slower uh, regulation of cortisol levels. Okay. The interesting thing is that the children who could only text and the children who had no access to their parents 
had very little uh, uh, oxytocin uh, compared to the other two groups, and the cortisol levels were prolonged. They had very high stress for a very long time. Now, what we know about neuroplasticity is that uh, in, in our brains is that our brains can change shape. And if you are exposed to cortisol, if your cortisol levels are high for long periods of time, then uh, it has dramatic effects on the way in which we self-regulate. Uh, so take, for instance, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, anxiety disorders, um, uh, tend to, to, to be situations where one has... Uh, uh, high levels of cortisol continuously in the fight or flight mode of living and we don't know how to regulate. And if we are in that place, it is very difficult to empathize with people around us and it is very difficult to even think about doing, um, doing good deeds. So it's no surprise that with children we find the steep increase in narcissistic behavior because there's an a, a, a lack of being able to identify with with people, you know. So communication strategies. This is the last one now. <clears throat> communication strategies. Uh, this is what we can do in order to help ourselves, care for ourselves when it comes to communication. Uh, I tell our children whenever there is a dispute. Um, and I know that the temptation is always there to go onto WhatsApp and, you know, go and, you know, give the, the person, you know, grief via text. Say, no, no, no. If the uh, WhatsApp is there to let me know that you are running late or WhatsApp is there when you want to just give me a trivial piece of information or, or important piece of information, but I mean, it's not life changing. Uh, Whenever there are matters that need to be discussed seriously or uh, if there are conversations to take place, I tell my kids it is important to see the white in the other person's eyes. If you can't see the white in the other person's eyes, then you know it is not the right way to communicate. And you certainly cannot resolve any conflict that way. So make communication personal. It is self-edifying, self-caring for me to meet with another person in person, or if I can't meet with another person, at least a video call that I, I, can, I can see face to face. But don't engage serious communication over text. That is a big no-no. Secondly, to limit screen time. Um, I, I did an exercise during Lent uh, one year. Uh, Lent is the, the season just before Easter, those 40 days where you give up something and you replace it with something else. I did a, a little experiment with myself and I, because I'm, I'm constantly on Facebook as Jackie will be able to, to testify. Um, but uh, what I did for, for, that, for those 40 days is that instead of posting something on social media, I phoned a friend and I told them about it. Mm. Just that. Uh, so limiting screen time is, uh, is important. What do you do when you wake up in the morning? First thing, you check your Facebook or you check your emails. Okay, which leads us to the third point of, of communication. Charge your phone overnight in another room. So that when you sleep, you can get your eight hours sleep. Uh, the temptation is there when you get up in the middle of the night and you go to the loo, you come back, you think, oh, well, let me just quickly check. No, that activates the brain and you can't sleep properly. Charge phone in another room. Switch it off quite preferably. Okay. And then engage in self-conversation. Speak to yourself. Uh, I know people will say, you know, the, there's medication for that, but it's important for us to, to speak to ourselves. Sorry, it is a very bad joke. Um, journaling, that is self-conversation. I can speak to myself, reflecting, meditating, prayer, 
being in conversation with myself, being in my uh, in conversation with God, and being in conversation with others, but uh, self conversation. Uh, just as important that I need to check in with myself and to ask myself, where do I find you? Where do I find me? Okay. So, uh, so in a nutshell, social justice, where does it begin? For me, it begins with me. And it means that I need to give justice to myself. Uh, I need to care for myself. Um, and if I am able to love myself, then I can go to Jesus' second step. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And love God with your entire being. So uh, just to uh, a short recap of those, uh, those four building blocks. Time. How do I spend my time? Imagination. Reflection. And communication. This is not a... A conclusive list um, but uh, I think it is a good starting point where, uh, where we can take off okay right Jackie I think my time is really up so this, uh, no but, but I think really we, we'd like to just spend a couple of moments now kind of um, asking you a couple of questions I mean I think you've, you've created us for us a structure of, of how we can actually engage um, social justice, but I think that you've also presented for us all sorts of possibilities for why the stress factors are high at the moment, what we're going through in the country, why our responses are, where our humanity sits. So just kind of want to see, um, if you don't mind, we, we, we do have um, an hour and, and 15 minutes set aside for this, but um, just some, some questions that people might have. So if you can pop up your hands virtually, you can't organize that, unmute yourself. Um, and, and if there's any questions you might have for Vessel. Not because he's a professor should you be intimidated. But no, please, I'm, I'm just Vessel. That's, <laughs> that's all. Thank you. Good, it's nice. We're starting to see a few more, few more screens. Vessel, oh, there we go. Wait, I see. Is that a hand there? Sipo, I knew the question would come from you. Go for it. Are you there, Sipo? I'm going to. Yes, I'm here, Jackie. Uh, thanks. Can, can... Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Vessel, for a wonderful presentation. I, I just want to make a follow up on your point on imagination. Uh, mm. Yes, I just yes, I just wanted to ask if uh, do do you think imagination is sufficient? Uh, uh, yeah, based on 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 what you were sharing with us. Uh, do, do we, you, you used an, an example of the parables, do we only need to imagine ourselves into the story or we also maybe need to imagine ourselves and be willing to participate in it? Because, because I feel as if imagining it can, can only give us that intellectual uh, and removed satisfaction without actually getting our hands dirty. So, so what about participation? What, what, what do you think about that? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So, so my focus there is, uh, you know, just uh, on, on the first two aspects of, uh, of social justice. So self-care and empathy, which can then lead to altruism and, and acts of, um, you know, of justice. Uh, so my point with, with imagination is that if we, uh, if we spend a bit more time with imagination, then, then it would become uh, a skill uh, that is um, that we become more proficient at when we start identifying with people around us. So if I go and read, for instance, Cry the Beloved Country, you know, um, and or I can I, I, I go to to any of the um, the uh, the books that. Uh, 
that tell the story of you know where we've been as a nation or social justice uh, well uh, especially uh, um, uh, stories and, and I don't mean you know, artificial stories or untruths or anything like that but uh, but the retelling of the stories of struggle and poverty and so forth the more I immerse myself in that imaginative act, uh, I equip myself to be able to identify with people and with different situations much easier. So uh, just a, a, a quick illustration. Uh, so, so we use, uh, 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 psychologists uh, call it schemas. Um, so schemas uh, is, is a short way of saying, you know, we are very clever as human beings, but we are extremely lazy. So we, uh, we, we put things together. So if I go to the airport for the very first time, uh, it is a learning experience from the time I put my foot in the airport until I put my foot on the airplane. So I need to, I need to now go to the counter. I need to go and check in. Then I need to go to security. I mean, I don't know these steps beforehand. So every, every moment is an anxious experience and a new experience of learning. Uh, but if I travel often enough, then I can almost go through the whole system blindfolded. Um, I've equipped myself with a schema or a mind map that helps me to progress through the, uh, through the different uh, phases of travel so that um, you know, when I get to the airport now, I find myself on the airplane and I can't even remember how, you know, how I got to, to that place. Or you know, if you're driving a certain route every single day, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you know, many of us experience a place where you leave home and you get to your workplace and you think to yourself, you know, I hope I didn't skip a robot because I can't remember the journey. It came so automatically. The point of that is, that is a schema that is built. And the more we immerse ourselves in imagination uh, or uh, contexts where we have to use our imagination to identify with people around us, the easier it becomes for us to show empathy, which then leads to acts of justice um, uh, altruism, whatever the case may be. Uh, without that, I think there's, there's a little bit of a disjuncture between uh, who I am and what I'm doing, but I'm not feeling. Now, I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. Absolutely. Would you Absolutely. like to comment to that? Well, well, yeah, I think, I think I agree. Uh, I, yeah, thanks for that, for that clarification. Uh, yeah, I guess you 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 tempt it differently. Yeah, uh, those works of altruism. I, I guess it's works of piety, uh, maybe in in some other language. But yes, I agree. It they definitely align. Uh, yeah, with with that uh, imagination, maybe conversion of the mind. Maybe Paul will call it in Romans twelve. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I, I'm fully agreed. Thanks, Thanks Ipo. Thanks what for the question. One of the statements we have at Grace Point is finding grace, living change. And what is the transformative path? You know, where do we actually live out a place of transformation? And, and I think that, you know, we often return back to the places, you know, where our imagination holds, you know, transformation and what we imagine possible. And I think that, you know, if we look around our country at the moment, if we look around our, our desire as a community to, to seek justice, to be involved in acts of piety, um, what are they and what are the reasons we do them? So often we just do them. Um, and rather than actually, you know, reflect. And I think, Vessel, you've taken us through that place tonight. What are the things that form the reasoning why we act? And I think that that, that is a helpful place, especially um, when we think of the scripture that speaks about love. You know, if you do it without love, what is the point? So you, you draw us into that place. So can I give you the last word tonight? Um, and then if I wouldn't, after, after that, we'll close in prayer. Any last thoughts for us um, as we conclude our night together tonight? Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, if, if, uh, if people are interested in, uh, you know, well, th this is the, the stuff that, uh, you know, is, is part of my, my research projects. Um, so if people would like to, you know, get in touch with me, more than welcome to do so. And I can pass on some resources that, um, that will underline, you know, uh, 
this is not a thumbs up, you know, my things. Uh, this is, you know, uh, uh, research that is uh, that's going on around the world. I'm more than willing to share those resources. But uh, but to say, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think Jesus has got it right. You know, don't overthink this thing. Uh, love the Lord your God. Uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And and that's the challenge. If we do those things. We won't have time to to do the stuff we're not supposed to do, you know. <laughs> so, but thank you very much to everybody for uh, for spending your Tuesday evening, um, yeah, in the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bessel. It was so good having you with us. Um, we'd love to invite you back um, because I think that you're going to push a whole bunch of questions for us and we'll be ready for them again next time when we meet. Friends, um, so if you are comfortable right now um, with just kind of unblocking un, um, your video and kind of just putting your um, video on, let's join together as we um, say the final prayer and we bless each other with a benediction. So let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you that you create us all in your image. And that creation brings us into a conversation with you and ourselves and one another that can literally change the world. That there is nothing that we go through that is beyond the reach of your spirit and your presence. So we thank you tonight, God. And we pray that as we leave here tonight, that there would be a stirring of your spirit that would help us reimagine who we are in you so that the world we touch is not touched by something that sits on a tick box of some agenda, but God experiences the emotion of our hearts and the expression of our love. And so God, as we leave here tonight, we say together the benediction and I invite you now to unmute yourself and let there be holy chaos in whatever language um, resonates with your soul as we bless each other. That is our practice to actually bless one another with a benediction. And let's say that together. Now, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Cheers, everyone. Let's bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You. Thank you, Jackie. Bye, everyone.